Hi, everyone. Uh, I thought I would do a personal video, meaning tell you a little bit about my personal life uh, where I had given up all my wealth, all my assets, my home in Malibu with our ocean view and my business. I turned it over to an associate, made him my partner, just asked for a, a percentage of the business he had, enough that we, as long as he kept working, we would be able to live in Costa Rica. And, um, and that's basically uh, what we did. And we took all our savings and used it to come to this country of Costa Rica in 1998 and uh, had no job, no income there uh, from the people from working there. We just simply would be doing ministry 100% of the time that we could. And uh, so this is what the story of that is. Now, I just want to show you, it wasn't a exactly what a Costa Rican would live like. They would rent and live in homes that would be $70, $80 a month. We were living in something somewhat more, more than that. This is actually the window, the only window that we would usually use because we had, this is our only true living space. We had a, what they call, uh, well, a, a an extra area, which was a butterfly farm, but it's just this big, like it's a big garage uh, and you would never go in there. And, but so we literally had about this much space that you're seeing. That was our living room and had a couple of bedrooms next to this and they were super small. So, but we had a beautiful view. We could sit at the table in the morning and have breakfast and it would look like this or get out on the patio and sit there and just enjoy the view. It's just gorgeous. And, um, and this is near a town called Gracia in Costa Rica. Now we had a little dog. Well, I can't call her little, <laughs> Her name is Bear, and in Costa Rica, she's known as Osita, which means little bear girl. And uh, this was a, uh, if you went behind our house and climbed through a lot of brush and whatever, you get down to the river, and you would see this beautiful area for, with impatience. And our dog, uh, she's a Newfoundland mix. She would run into the impatience and just sit there. So this was a wonderful thing. We, we enjoyed uh, our life with her there. And, uh, and the views at night when we sit on the patio, we'd have these beautiful views. So we gave up the Malibu view, Malibu view, which cost a hell of a lot more money than we were spending here to enjoy a very, very beautiful view and a very serene environment. So even though we gave up all our assets, uh, cars, we now had a, a junker car in Costa Rica. That was my strategy so it wouldn't get robbed. So you don't have a nice car anymore. You just live as poor as you possibly can. And that's what we did. So people have been saying, hey, you know, uh, this uh, account of the rich man, he has to give up everything. You know, have you given up everything you you uh, owned? Well, I did that in this time period for sure. And uh, and we were really blessed. And this was how we came to the Jesus words only principle. And so I was uh, trying to be doing what Christ wanted. But I also that was always my objective. I didn't want to be a lawyer all my life. I wanted to be a uh, a servant of christ that was always my objective so i this is my my big leap and only 9 11 brought us back home in the united states unfortunately and again you can just see the beautiful evening skies of costa rica it's just a great place to live but anyway we it's all the story i'm going to tell you is how i uh, learned that people didn't accept the faith alone doctrine like i was accepting so the only thing up to this point that I had questioned was eternal security. And the uh, and that's why I uh, I was confronting an elder and I said, you know what, I've just read Mark 9, verse 42 to 47, and Jesus is there. And this is a Presbyterian church, which totally believes in predestination and eternal security. And I said uh, to the elder, my elder, I said, well, Jesus says, you know, when a believer in me falls into sin, stumbles, they have to only two choices. They can go to heaven, man, or hell, whole. And I said, how do we square this with Paul saying you you are eternally secure? I just, I don't think it works that way because if you are a believer, you're saved in theory, right? And then you sin. And Jesus is saying, when you stumble and sin, you got to cut off the body part and staring you in sin, your hand, leg, lie, whatever it might be. And if you don't do that, you're going to go to hell. He clearly says, so a believer can go to hell. And the, the elder says to me, oh, uh, that was for a different dispensation. We're no longer under the law, so we don't have to worry about it. And that was his answer. I mean, not resolve that matter definitively. I moved on and I eventually decided we're going to just go do missionary work and leave that issue to be resolved some other time. Uh, and 
So we moved to Costa Rica. We moved to an area near Gracia, Costa Rica. It's on the what they call the, the plateau. It's a mile high, actually, and that's why it's a perfectly temperate co- climate. And then we got involved in ministry in, in uh, downtown San Jose, uh, and the area was called Las Tablas, which means the boards. And these homes, if you look at them, don't really look like they're well-made, do they? Because they're made of boards, boards that they find randomly that are thrown away because these people are extremely poor and they would build their homes on what is is this land. Anybody owns this land? No, it's called a precario, which means at any time the government wants to, they can come in with bulldozers and just bulldoze your home. They might give you a little notice, maybe a day or two. We saw another precario get just wiped out in a matter of hours while we were watching from below. It was up on a hill. And that's what this was, a precario, meaning it doesn't have any legal status of ownership. Yet they have all, they, they live like a normal, as if they're normal living people. But anyway, so we went to this community and in there we uh, assisted another couple who had started this ministry before us and we helped them and we uh, tried to do things that we had com- capacity, specifically with computers. And um, just to make a, 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 you know, a nice thank you uh, uh, there was a donation by a major, uh, uh, software company at the time, Microsoft of $25,000 to three locations, the Ogar Zoe, which is an affiliate of Las Tablas church that we were starting up in this uh, little Procario here. And then there was another, uh, uh, computer room or computer setup in what was the facility where men were being held in prison. And, uh, in each of these facilities, there were this twenty-five thousand dollar gift in each one of them, and a very uh, secure door on each of these three facilities because theft is is common in Costa Rica at, at that time. And so, um, you know, one of the tasks I did was to set up the computer software on each one of these to teach people English and math, mathematics. I put all these mathematic programs on there to try to help them. In nineteen ninety-eight, by the way, this was the Windows ninety-five for all you. Uh, uh, young people, you don't even know what that was, but it was primitive compared to what you see today. And uh, I tried to even use DOS. So we had DOS and Windows 95 in the same computers. And I cre- and there was PowerPoint then, and we created PowerPoint slides to teach using Jackie Velasquez music. Uh, I put on one slide on one side, Jackie in Spanish, and then Jackie in English so that the people could learn in, uh, English by singing her songs in both Spanish and English with the words on the page, on the screen. So uh, these, these are trying to try to be inventive at the time. So uh, anyway, so this is how I started and what the ministry was. And so you just to show you what it looks like. So we had these kids and uh, they could be from age three, four, all the way up to seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Uh, there was not really, nobody would be turned away. Let's put it that way. And uh, as they like to call us gringos, but they meant it affectionately. We would be the ones who would gather up the food and give it to the ladies of the community. And they had these big pots and flame and whatever, and they would then cook it all up and then the kids would eat. And that would be a big deal for these kids because because it seemed pretty obvious they had not eaten all the time. And that's this was a very, like a treat for them. And uh, also, you see, we always had a Bible verse. I mean, it was just uh, things that we would help memorize. And we had little sabanas. We'd teach them uh, verses by having a missing word. And so they'd have to tell us what the missing word. So you write all the verses out, but you leave out a word here and there. And that would help them memorize the verse. And you could just also see, I, I randomly picked these pictures. And then I looked at them. Doug, do you see something in common between the, the one here on the top left and the bottom right? These kids love each other. These are not sisters. These are not brothers. These are totally just kids who love one another. This is a country of peace and love. It's just really just touching to be around them. Just a, uh, I miss them. Very sweet people. Here's Wilson, one of my favorites, and he's coming in the door. And I, I left this photo in because I wanted you to see something. You see there's this, it falls off a cliff almost here. Well, there's a river there. And just so you know, in the Precario, where are they going to throw trash? There's no trash pickup in a Precario because you're living on you're, you're 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 living on borrowed time. So all the trash gets thrown in the river, just to show you. And they live like this. And the river water has got to be polluted and so on. So this is just 
not a healthy environment and it's not it could not be possibly sanitary just so you know but anyway we got by we didn't die and uh, the kids loved our dog a uh, bear i think i showed you bear earlier and uh they've nobody had ever seen a dog this size i'm gonna tell a quick story is a guy uh we were out trying to bring pe people bring the kids to the park you'll see there's a little park is the wrong word a little center area and for whatever reason, this guy was going to stick me with the knife. I don't think he would have killed me, but it wouldn't have felt good. And um, and then my dog is right behind me. <laughs> I'm holding her with my right hand behind me because, you know, it's a very narrow little, if you look at this thing where Wilson's standing on the right, that gets narrow and narrow as you get towards the little center field people go to for uh, playing games and stuff. And uh, so he was going to stick me and it was very tight space. But when I pulled my dog up, <laughs> they have never seen a dog like, a you know, she's almost the size of a Newfie. Uh, they were scared and, and that saved my life. So I could have easily been killed or severely wounded from from a stab wound to the stomach. That's what he wanted to do. But I don't know. You know, God is great. And I just thank God I got through that. But uh, so this is a you know, uh, a, a real life situation where you got to be on your toes. And I just want to tell you another thing is these kids had never had a photograph of themselves ever made. So I was trying to keep track of their names and who they were for the group, all the people who are ministering, because we had uh, another couple of myself were the cent center for, but then there were other people who liked fellowship from the, we were attending a uh, a church all together in San Jose. There was an English speaking church. And this is, this is our activity. This was actually Shabbat or Sabbath, but we didn't know it was Sabbath those days. We just thought it was Saturday. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so we would, uh, try to give them a gift that they would remember from even the, the work I'm trying to do is keeping track of their names and having photos of them for that purpose. So I would take pictures of, I'd have to pretty much take picture of everybody each week. I would then ship it back online over the internet to, uh, I can't even remember the name of the company, but they would then print out the print prints, send it to my address that I have that would then internationally forward it to a mailbox in San Jose, Costa Rica. And I would have the pictures and I was able to give it to them. And uh, years later, when we visited again, some of these people had these pictures that I'd given them when they were kids. And it was like the only pictures they had of themselves as children. So I really appreciated that opportunity God gave me to share that with them. And we did arts and crafts. And then this is the park I was telling you. So this is a pretty uh, good picture of where they, what they're doing. They're squatting. You, know, you could say they're squatting on the land. And but they're very happy people, even though they have nothing, they have nothing, but they're so happy. And then we got clowns for them and we did face painting. Uh, that's I can't remember her name, Daniela, Danielle, and I can't remember her name. But anyway, this is the face painting and the clowns and all the stuff. So they had a lot of fun and more verses and so on. And this is what I did. I kept track of all their names and there's like a lot more panels than this. There was over two. I think it was over 250 kids. And we kept track of their spiritual path and where they were and those who asked to take Christ into their heart and all these different things. And that was, uh, but I always thought that if you could know the kids' names, you see here, every kid has a name. I would go around and make sure I had every kid's name. And when you recognize a child by their name, they feel really loved. But if you just say, hey, hi, how are you? And all that, it's not the same. If you know their name, they, they, they think you uh, remember them. And that's very important in ministry, just just uh, an aside from everything else. And then uh, and this is getting close to what I want to tell you. The story is um, now I'm not I blanked out this gentleman's name. His name is Chris, but I'm not going to tell you his last name. He's a, uh, uh, an American and he was he's a great guy. He was so important in getting those three computer state centers done. That's his totally his work. And this was Ogar Zoe, and it was another type of situation where uh, they, they had this was more fluent. These people weren't on a precario, but they were uh, not rich or anything. And this is where I understood now that we were working as a satellite ministry of what Chris was creating within an Assembly of God church. But in Costa Rica, it was called, uh, I think it was called Asamblea del Dios, if I recollect. So and and due to chris's great work is it also was involved in this ministry of rehabilitacion zoe so this is a 
a ministry that also was helping men who were caught on drugs to be re redirected out of the prison system and to go into what Chris had created, which is this program of uh, uh, guys who would be cured of their drugs by being forced <laughs> to stop drugs suddenly and go out and, and uh, collect coffee beans and on farms that were run uh, by a, a company that was dedicated to actually helping the poor that Chris ran. Uh, and so that was a really great thing to know him, a great uh, person, in my opinion. That's all. That's my opinion. But that's where I realized we had a, an affiliation with the Assembly of God, in, but in the Costa Rica re arena, which is, turns out was not, it's affiliated with the United States, but is independently operating and has it's different beliefs it turned out to be and that's where I'm, I'm leading up to now okay now with that background i'm going to tell you uh how the experience in costa rica had one particular event that is uh, sticks in my brain as what led me to question paul later in 2002 when i get home and i'm starting to write on eternal security this is what happened so the Assembly of God Church, this one here that Chris is affiliated with, it invites a full-time pastor to move from the United States who's bilingual, but he's a primarily English speaker with his wife and his several children, and come to Costa Rica and be a pastor. And why would they do that? Because even though those ni that nice couple are nice people, they're not trained like an American pastor would be. So they were hoping that these people would be a benefit with a better knowledge of the Bible and so on. And that's why the Assembly of God, Assemblea del Dios, brought them into Costa Rica. But it wasn't two or three weeks after the pastor arrived that something happened. Now, this pastor and I had become friends because he somehow connected with me when I would go work on the computers at the where the men were imprisoned and I would be doing the computers there and I would be doing the computers sometimes at Hogar Zoe or mostly at Las Tablas. So whatever it was, I knew him and we became friends and he was a really nice guy. And he tells me one day, he says, Doug, I'd like to go to lunch with you in Escazú. So it's going to take me to lunch. So, okay. So I'll drive in to do that trip with him and have this uh, lunch with him. And I'll never forget it. We're sitting there and we're talking about a lot of different things. He says, Doug, I got to tell you something that's kind of embarrassing to me. And I go, what's that? And he says, well, I, I got hired by this church to come here. I, we, I moved the family. We're all, we're all here. And they decided I have to go back home. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I was teaching the a doctrine that you and I accept as fact, right? You know, faith alone. And well, they apparently don't believe in that. And they, they told me, you know, because we don't accept that doctrine, you have to go home. <laughs> like what? You got to be kidding me. And again, I'm a total Pauline Christian at this point. I, I, I believe I started not that way because I didn't even have a church affiliation when I, I found Christ by myself reading the Bible and just said, I, I'm going to place my my trust in you and I'm going to obey you and I'm going to repent for my sins. That's how I started when I was 14 years old. But now I'm in my 40s and I'm I, I'm still dedicated to Christ, but I'm filled with Pauline ideas. And I'm like, you're right. These people, what, what's wrong? I can't understand it. And uh, and so, you know, I commiserated with him and I felt bad for him, but he basically did have to go and he had had to leave. And, and, you know, all that expense and money and time and effort and embarrassment to have to go back because and over a doctrine that that uh, the main church the assembly of God, he assumed, you know, the, the, the affiliates would all have the same view on the co core doctrine of the church as we know it at that time. And and still probably in most of 99 percent of Christianity as of today. So that's that that's happened. But then I didn't leave it there. I so he's gone and I'm going to I can't believe what I, I heard. And so I'm going to research this. And um, I so I went up near the church, uh, the neighborhood of Argentina in our neighborhood. So back, uh, so when we w went to this Las Tablas, we had to drive in about 50 minutes. Uh, so this was a once a week thing. And but where we lived was near uh, a couple of communities. And one of them was called Argentina. That's not the country, it's, it's the neighborhood, Argentina. And I wanna show you a little bit of that. 
So let me tell you why I was in this Argentina area. My wife was teaching English for free. She, again, she was doing ministry as well and would use Bible songs and Bible verses to teach them English. And in their public schools, that's totally great. <laughs> The administrators love you teaching the Bible and teaching English through the Bible. So she did that. And here's her boards. I took pictures of her boards of how to pronounce the letters. So the letter A, A in English would be A, E, I in Spanish. And B would be B, see, what she did very clever. And so she was trying to teach them the pronunciation of the words. And so I would hang out with her. I would, I would again do the computers, uh, I, excuse me, I'd be do the lessons on computer that she would then distribute. So if she gave it an exam, I would help on the technical word processing stuff. And that's, but otherwise she would draft out the questions and everything. And I would just type it up. So she was very committed to doing a great job and the kids loved her and they loved our dog bear. And so I'm sitting around there and I'm pondering, uh, I know there's a little church just a little way away. Laura, my wife, my wife is busy. So I'm going to walk just a, hundred yards and I'm going to go check out this church and see if there's a pastor in there where I can ask the question, is there something, a reason why this church, the assembly of God does this? And I don't know what this other guy is. I know he's Protestant, but I don't know what he is. So I go in there and I sit in his chair. Literally you walk in and his office is right inside the front door. So it's like a little house almost. And I sit there with him and I say, look, I tell him the whole story about this pastor came from the United States. It's assembly of God. Do you know their, their doctrine? Do you know, think of their strange or anything? And he says, no, I don't think so. And, and I say, well, this is what happened. They say that they don't believe in faith alone. And they think he's a heretic basically. And, you know, from where I come from, this is just normal, normal thought. And then he says to me, do you believe in Santiago? Do I believe in Santiago? Well, I know what that means. James. And so we, we don't realize this, but James is not correctly translated in the English Bible. It's James. His name is actually Jacob, but for whatever reason, it's San, Sant Saint Iago. So Jacob in Spanish is Iago, and you do San Iago, and you get Santiago. And I don't remember uh, exactly whether I had a Bible with me, I brought it with me. I don't think so, but, or he gave it to me, but I remember the words and I believe he, I think he handed me the Reina Valera and he's reading also from the Reina Valera. I think that's what happened, but whatever it is, he's going to read me Santiago. So I'm going to read to you Santiago James chapter two, what he read to me. And I'm going to read it to you in Spanish and translate it on the fly. Hermanos míos, my brothers, de qué aprovechará? What benefit is it? What good will it do? Si alguno dice que tiene fe, if someone says they have faith, y no tiene obras, and don't have works, ¿podrá la fe sal salvarle? Can faith save him? It's a rhetorical question, meaning no, in English and in Spanish, and in Greek, by the way. Y si un hermano o una hermana está desnudos, they don't have any clothes, any brother or sister have no clothes, y tienen necesidad de mantenimiento de cada día, and they need their daily maintenance, their food, y alguno de vosotros le dice, and some of you say, id en paz, go in peace, Cal calentaos y sacios, you know, be well and be well and good, pero no les dais las cosas que son necesarias para el cuerpo, and you don't give them anything they need for their body. De que aprovecha. What benefit is that? What good is that? And then verse 17. And this is, it's a killer. If you really know this, sound of this in Spanish. Así también la fe. So also is faith. Si no tiene obras, es muerta en sí. It's dead in itself. It has no life. It cannot do you. It's, 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 it has no property of being alive. You're dead. You're not going to heaven. If it's faith that has no, 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 no tiene obras, es muerta en sí. And I, but I knew in my heart that we are told this is a, this is James is not Jesus. And so we don't have to listen to him. And Jesus is talking to Paul. So that's it. So we don't have to listen to this. And that's how I processed it at the time. But it raised the question in my mind, how could this be in the Bible? And Paul being in the Bible at the same time. So I had to determine what the answer to that was. 
And so, and I've shown this to you before, I started with an idea of, could it be when you read the reign of Alera, you get a different impression about salvation. It's not faith alone. It's something more. So I took a look at the reign of Valera from 1605 and 1909 and compared it to the King James and NIV. I've shown you this video, uh, th this topic in a video entitled uh, The Spirit of Reign of Valera over the King James and NIV. And what I did is I went through and I did uh, translations of these passages and I just tried to look at them. I studied Greek, classical Greek in high school uh, and Latin, and I received a certificate of excellence in classical languages. And so I have some ability to do this, and uh, but uh, you can just see it if you even know. But you have to know Spanish also to figure this one out. So if you look at the RVA and the the Reign of Valera and the NIV, you'll see there's something different even in Ephesians two eight and nine. So there it says uh, it uses the present tense like in Greek. So you are saved, uh, and in the in the Greek of 289, the Greek says you are being saved by grace by using the present indicative tense. So that's similar, but the NIV incorrectly translates this with the past tense, you have been saved by grace. Do you see the manipulation? Why would it say you've been saved, putting it in the past tense as if it's like you can't undo that, you'll always be saved. And that's what, if you read Paul elsewhere, you'll see that. So again, the reign of Valera has it right. It should be in present tense as what the Greek was, but the NIV uses a past tense. See, little things like that. John 3.16, the, uh, in the Greek, it's may not perish by using, uh, the, it uses the present subjunctive tense. And the KGV does this accurately, but the NIV adds a certitude by using future tense of shall not perish. And it's not it, it's a subjunctive tense. And uh, But the RVA has it right. It uses a present subjunctive for perish. It's correctly translated there, no se pierda and so on and so forth. So I just went through the whole thing and I, I we've done a whole video on this uh, comparison and the KJV is in, in inferior to uh, the RVA and so is the NIV. So they're, yeah, the Reign of Valera is a superior text over any other Bible that I could figure out. And I, I tested on nine things, but uh, whenever I can, I just compare it anyway, periodically. And it just always comes out that for some reason, the Reign of Valera, which was done at Geneva. So the Spanish guy is being supported by the same people who are making the Geneva Bible st study Bible, which are the Calvinists, for whatever reason, he is independently minded and he is able to do a better translation. Well, probably because in Spanish, the tenses in Greek all have a corresponding structure that matches Spanish. You know, you can have a subjunctive and so on. It's it's easily identified. But in English, it's all different kind of constructions end up being subjunctive, but they're not they don't have the same certitude or familiar structure that Greek and Spanish have. They, they have this connection that you, it's mysterious maybe to explain what I'm saying, but it's it's not like our English subjunctive, which comes from a Germanic type structure. And it's not the same quality of, uh, of certitude when you write these things. They can be ambiguous. And so even the English present tense can have a sense of past and present and future just in the present tense all by itself. So it just depends how you used it. So anyway, that's that's what I did. And I went through, I, I, let me just give, show you another example. Uh, 1 John 3, 5, KGV and NIV and RVA, there's an erroneous addition to the uh, 1 John 3, 5. It doesn't say, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. It doesn't say that. It takes away sins. So this idea of limited atonement is Jesus only died for our sins. And that was the Calvinist doctrine. So why why is KGB and NAV adding our? But see, even, uh, even the RVA has it. So see, uh, the guy, Reina Valera, is being paid by the Geneva church. So he himself goes into this, but it's not there. And what's interesting is even the Latin Vulgate doesn't have it. See, if you go back and you see, um, ut pacata toleret, take away sin, does not have the word are there. And uh, then Vincent in his volume three of his word studies points out that there is no Greek text that has the word are, it simply is sin. So you can see here, there is one example where the reign of Valera corrupted itself to suit its master, which is the people who are paying his bills, the people at Geneva, the Protestant Calvinists who believe that Jesus, uh, his atonement is limited only to those people he had already predetermined to say to be saved. And you, you cannot have all the sin of the world paid by Jesus. See how they've done it. They redefined it. it has to be our. So this is something that's a corruption.
for, for doctrinal reasons. It's theological translating, as I've said. Okay, so now you know how I came into this issue. I, and I would say if it were, wasn't for this church, this Assembly of God church, uh, telling somebody a very tough lesson is we, we are so committed to teaching the G doctrines of Jesus that we are going to go with his brother, James, chapter 2, which, by the way, is actually paraphrasing this the parable of the sheep and the goats about feeding and clothing uh, the fellow brothers and sisters. And if you don't do that, Jesus says, you're going to be thrown into the same place where the devil and his angels go. So he was right, by the way, that pastor. Uh, uh, I mean, that church that d discharged the pastor. So that was a real wake-up call and made me start w down the path of studying the Reign of Valera carefully and examining it against the, the NIV and the KGV to see if there's a theological bias to for some reason. And I started seeing the pattern was Reign of Valera was correct when the NIV and the KGV were both wrong, or at least one of the two was wrong. And so there is some sort of agenda going on. And then when you realize there's a filter or a narrative going on when you're reading this scripture, you'd have to be much more cautious about what you believe. And therefore, you really have to dig in deep and try to figure this out. So, uh, but this was the key. And I just want to say, if this church in Costa Rica had not been brave enough to send the guy packing because he taught faith alone, I wouldn't be here today because I would never have thought this question was a serious one that had to be resolved. I thought it was just so solved in, in, irreversibly. There was no way anybody would think of anything different than what we learn in America. And uh, But in Costa Rica, the native Costa Ricans have revered in the scripture of James, and they did not treat it as a, a pistol of straw as Luther had taught. All right, I hope that helps you in your path that you might take a second look at the Santiago, the book of James. Ciao. Bye. Hello.